Okay, Johnny is learning to shave. Practice number two. Okay, Johnny, pick up your comb, which you're going to use as a, sh as a razor, mm -hmm. and start to shave your face. Very good. Excellent. And under your chin. Lovely. Well done. That's it, that's a bit around the edge. <laughs> that's it. That's brilliant. And have you got some around the side of your face here? That's it. Okay, and the other side. Have a look, have you got a clean, a close shave? <laughs> and now it's all nice and clean, and all the hairs have come off. I believe in the hallelujah chorus of the shopping malls. We say we can't, we know we shan't, well of course we shall, cause I've seen, I believe. During his time as director of the Poetry Festival, he brought some amazing poets to Manchester, everyone from Tony Harrison to Seamus Heaney, Linton Kwesi Johnson to Pammers. <laughs> um, and then, as well as kind of nurturing lots and lots of poets within the city, he also managed to find time to write six collections of poetry himself, including Nude Modelling for the Afterlife, which was published by Blood Axe. He was a regular performer himself on, on the UK poetry scene. I think the first time I encountered Henry, it was at an event in Wigan Library where he was sharing the bill with uh, the author of a, a kind of local history saga, and Lancashire Hot Pot. Um, <laughs> Henry was, of course, the highlight of the evening. Um, he, as you know, he then moved on to an extremely successful career in TV and film, writing probably the, the best TV comedies. We're delighted that after a 20 year break from poetry, Henry has found himself back to his first passion and he's going to be reading tonight from his brand new collection, staring directly at the eclipse, poems about death, human frailty and other classic conversational stoppers. <laughs> I'm sure tonight he will actually be starting many conversations. So please welcome Henry Norman. Kathy, that's the best introduction I've ever had in, in my life. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, all for coming out. That's really nice. That Lancashire hot pot was good, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, you know what I think? I think I was second on that bill. <laughs> that's the uh, comedy store, which is uh, a brilliant thing to have in Manchester, but there was nothing like that. There was no comedy clubs when I started. Uh, it was uh, folk clubs, jazz clubs, pop concerts, prisons, hospitals, libraries, tops of buses. You perform anywhere you can, but you, you know, there's no idea. You were always on with something else. Like I remember doing Stockport Town Hall uh, and I, there was Can Can dancers before me. And then I just played lots of gigs with lots of different things. And sometimes people had come for the music and they wouldn't come for the poetry or they wouldn't come for the comedy. And sometimes they'd come for the comedy, they wouldn't come for the music. So. It was always a little bit that you were having to convert people. Whereas nowadays, of course, you go to a comedy club and they've come for comedy, so you'd hope it's a little bit easier. And tonight, obviously, uh, they've come for literature. Um, let's hope they get some. Tell a little bit, before I start, tell a little bit about how I started the, uh, the Poetry Festival, because you, you might find it interesting. I used to do gigs with Len, uh, and we used to go to all these rural places. Both Len and I are, are quite urban 
I should have, you know, an urban poetry festival. I did a television show, I don't know if any of you have watched it, I apologise if you have, called Packet of Three. Uh, and I was so unhappy after that that um, I, I had lots of money because I'd done television. And I thought, this money's not making me happy. You know, it'd be great if it could make somebody happy. So I put that money, about £3,000 it was, down and to get um, the first poetry festival going. And we had posters, we used to fly post posters, and we got all these great poets. My favourite moment in it, uh, I'd just like to tell you, is when we had Seamus Heaney. We had Seamus Heaney uh, two days after he'd won the Nobel Prize. Uh, and he came over from Sweden. He, he got a cheque in his pocket. Because when you win the Nobel Prize, you give you a cheque for about a million pounds. Right? So you got a cheque for a million pounds. I said, we've got, we've got about 350 people waiting for you at the We With Our Gallery. I, I've, got you, I've got you 600 pounds uh, for, for, for the gig. And he said, you haven't got it in cash, have you? <laughs> so, so we went to an hole in the wall, uh, and we, we got the cash out and gave it to him in cash, because he couldn't cash this cheque. I think we're too big. That's all. And he went to the, you'll remember this, he went to the Wheel of Art Gallery and everybody stood up. Everybody stood up and applauded him in. And I've got to say, if I never do anything else in my life, that was one of the best moments. So this behind me is where the, uh, uh, the banks are. I used to be at uh, Barclays Bank. And I remember I, I did a load of gigs and I got a thousand pounds. And it was the first time I'd earned a thousand pounds. And I put it in the bank and I got, I saw, saw it, saw it, it said a thousand pounds in the bank. And I thought, I am never going to spend that. Ne I will always have a thousand pound. I'll be the richest man in the world. Uh, it lost about two weeks. So I, I, didn't, I didn't do any, uh, any poetry for, for years. And then about two years ago, I, I started. And I thought I'll, I'll, I'll do poetry a little bit different from what I did. I thought I, I, I'll give up cliches. <laughs> and the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's me new joke. <laughs> That's the world premiere of that joke. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a poem called Song's Pretension. Uh, and it's about the fact that uh, some people use French to, you know, to make themselves sound a bit uh, posh. Uh, and uh, and you know, some poets do use Greek and Roman words, which I, I think is a bit narcissistic. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? You're so much faster than the Birmingham Literature Festival. <laughs> Oh, that was hard work. Believe me. It's called Sans Pretension. We say cul-de-sac to make dead ends sound sunny. We say nouveau rich instead of working class with money. We call art avant-garde when we don't understand it. Jumble sell sell bric-a-brac, which must be French for shit. <laughs> Let's call a spud a spud. No more lies or elaborate word contortions. Chips are chips, not pommes frites or french fries. Why say oak cuisine when you mean smaller portions? <laughs> No more saying we had a tate to tate when you just mean you've just been nagging, bragging, or just chin wagging. And no more calling it a menage a trois when you mean three people shagging. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My first ever appearance on stage uh, was the back half of the dragon in uh, George and the Dragon. I'll be about nine. My mum and dad came to see me. And I was very proud that I was one of the named. Uh, people in the title, even though I was the back half. Uh, and all you could see, because of the costume, all you could see was my ankles. Uh, and uh, obviously at the time, it, it didn't occur to me uh, that, uh, that that was the extent to it. And I remember being, uh, being so proud that my mum and dad had come to see me. And uh, just, I think now they must have just, oh, look, there's our, uh, our Pete's ankles. I'm very lucky, I, I have a beautiful wife. Uh, she's beautiful all the way through, like a stick of rock. <laughs> Name's Angela. I met her in Manchester. She moved to Brighton, and I used to travel down uh, and, and see her at Brighton. I was younger, of course, at the time. I used to tell people I'd got a big sex drive. <laughs> <laughs> We're back on the jokes, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, she's from Peterborough. Right. So I thought she was a bit posh. It's a bit further south, isn't it? Yeah. Right. So, so uh, anyway, I, I went to see. I went to see her mum and dad. She said, "Oh, my dad." She says, "He's um, he's very particular about uh, you know table manners." So I was a bit on edge, like, and uh, so I sat there at the table and they're having the dinner and everything. Then for pudding, they brought apple pie with a chocolate ice on top. <laughs> I didn't give a fuck after that. <laughs> I thought they're as working class as I am. <laughs> so 
so, 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 I, so as, a, as a younger man, I, th I thought, I thought, I thought they're a bit, they're a bit conservative. I, I, I won't, I won't be able to sleep with uh, uh, Angie. You know, I'll have to sleep in a separate bed. And they said, no, 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 we, we're quite liberal. You, 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 you can sleep in there. And, and I went back into the into the bedroom, and Angie went to the, the bathroom, and um, and I lay in there in bed waiting for her, and uh, a mum came, <laughs> took me in. <laughs> It's the best contraception I've ever come across. <laughs> I couldn't do, I couldn't do a thing all night. <laughs> so, my favourite night, me and my wife will watch telly, uh, uh, Johnny will be up, up in bed, uh, uh, she'll put her feet on me uh, on my lap, uh, we'll get some chocolate or some Ogden Doss or something, uh, you know, and I'll rub her feet for as little as I can get away with. <laughs> And, and uh, we watch some telly. We see all these stuff on the telly which says, oh, you should be snowboarding or you should be bungee jumping or something. And I just think, no, you've got it wrong. Yeah. This is the best bit. Yeah. This is a poem about that. It's called, uh, I'm not belittled by your culture of ambition. <laughs> <laughs> My wife has a moustache. <laughs> it is plastic. It came out of a Christmas cracker. We are monarchy in our paper hats. I am King Superman in his favourite cardigan, full of pud. It's not a thought through image. We are ramshackle, a homely mess, like bric-a-brac to car boot. There's no sleekness to our design, no colour coordination, no concession to taste. Against all rules of fashion and against all aesthetic consideration, we are happy, at ease, daft in love. <laughs> These aren't huge gigs, so there's not a lot of people seeing them. Uh, so, but, it, but I am communicating in a, I hope, a, a personal way with a few individuals. Um, and it's a, it's a sort of a balance, really. I, 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 my mind at the moment is thinking that I love gigs, but I'm not sure I'd be away from home for more than one or two days at a time because I feel very grounded when I'm at home uh, and I want to keep hold of where it is I'm coming from rather than, you know, the idea of a 30-day tour and, you know, uh, sort of uh, three quarters of the way through feeling like you're the same person as you was at the beginning. Uh, I think you might get ground down a bit, right? This is about my, uh, my, my lad. My, my son's all autistic and uh, he's 18 now. He speaks in one word sentences. He'll never leave home. He'll never have a girlfriend. He'll never have a job. But we have a lovely life. As much as I've taught him, he's actually taught me. The thing that he's taught me the most, and, and it's with me now as, as, as we're here, is he's taught me to live in the present. Because we're so busy racing, 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 racing to catch up with themselves in some sort of way. Uh, we're looking at the, you know, analysing the past. We're, we're looking like meerkats at the future to see where the danger is. And we forget to actually live in the present. And, and Johnny lives in the present. And I love him for that. This is called Avio Genesis to Revelations. So it's, uh, it's about a, a photo I've got of, uh, of Johnny. Uh, how I started writing again after, after 20 years is I, I, I started by looking at photos of Johnny when he was a kid and, and trying to remember the journey that we've been through. Now, it was great to, to do that and, and it made me think about writing the things that are important. So the only thing you need to know about this is the human body uh, exists on uh, 40 watts of electricity. So uh, if you've ever seen that film, The Matrix, where they try and get all the electricity, load of, load of crap. <laughs> you know, one wind farm would do, do the lot of us. <laughs> 40 watts of electricity, not very much. Your brain has half that. So uh, your brain activity is, is off that. So th that's all you need to know for this poem. Uh, Abiogenesis to Revelations. 20 watts amid all this vitality. My one descendant holds a dinosaur up to the sunset. We are engaged in an exchange of energy. Half the stars in the Milky Way shine inside this precious three pounds. Electromagnetic radiation hitting the retina fires the optic nerve with the enormity of creation. 
The alchemy of emotion overwhelms, the ache infinite. I'm told there are no numbers or names in nature. Existence is independent of the mind. Love and beauty, just icons on a computer screen. I'm overawed by every single atom. Moments like this, I could believe in God. Moments like this, I could kiss him. So, and the other great thing you might want to ask is, he's not afraid of humans uh, uh, beings at all. Uh, it's a weird thing that, that, that we, it's one of the biggest fears is, is talking in front of other people. Like, like you know, uh, what other animals are afraid of other, zebras aren't afraid of zebras. <laughs> you know, and we, we've got, now my son's not afraid of any, any, any other human being. He's, he's brilliant. I'll give you an example, this is a true story, right? So um, my wife uh, is with him and they're, they're out and, and they're getting on a bus and, and uh, he said, you go upstairs whilst I pay. So uh, he goes upstairs and, and she pays and then she goes up the stairs and uh, there's only one person on the upstairs of the bus with Johnny sat next to him. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely though, isn't it? Yeah. He's got absolutely no fear, was it? Not as much fear as the bloke. <laughs> I'm definitely uh, aut autistic, but but I do have coping strategies, and and I I, I know that I find uh, emotional emotions difficult. I, th I think the poetry is part of me explaining things to myself and, and helping me understand things myself uh, and work working out. Um, and uh, see, I, I could never do any of these panel shows or anything like that because I'm not quick witted enough or. I haven't got the presence and understanding of, of everything around me to to be that in the moment and that sort of uh, connected. I, I'm, I'm slightly disconnected and I, I need to sit and think about things and work it out and, uh, and then I can, I can cope with it. The Exorcist, all the greats, Jim Davison. I like Jim Davison's bit in between the Wolverhampton Society of Artists and Frozen. That's the cultural mix that uh, really uh, exists in. Left for you. Yeah, so we will be selling these. These are nine pounds sixty, or if you've got an equity card, they're nine pounds sixty, darling. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there will be some jokes. You'll spot the jokes. There's big gaps between them. <laughs> so this is the first poem. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Curvius de la Manos, which is uh, uh, it means um, cave of hands. I place my left hand on that most solid. Spread out my fingers to form a stencil, blow kaolin and manganese through hollow bone to leave a silhouette. Whether we call it art or human nature, on every continent something survives, vulnerable as dust. Over 2,000 generations call, each with a simple statement, as urgent as blood through veins. I am here. I am here. I am here. The last time I came here, I had a drink with um, Tony Wilson, and um, he was going to set up a film uh, festival in uh, Manchester, and uh, he wanted to get lots of young people involved, because this is always Tony's thing, and he wanted to make it uh, an expression. And I remember sitting there and saying, uh, where are we going to get the money, Tony? And he said, uh, Henry, you're so London. <laughs> that was Tony all the way. He didn't care about the money, he just wanted, he just got passion to create. Come. I did this gig at Oaknell uh, and um, uh, it was the day I heard that Caroline Hearn had died. And uh, I, I knew Caroline very well. I, I wrote um, her four series of uh, The Mrs. Merton Show and I, I wrote uh, Royal Family with her. Uh, and my wife had arranged me a trip over to um, the lakes in, uh, in Italy 
uh, a couple of days later because I was I turned 60, 60 years, I, I know. <laughs> and and, uh, and so, so I'm, still at, I'm still at the lakes uh, and, I, and I'm thinking about, uh, Karen, I'm thinking about my dad who died of cancer and I'm thinking about uh, my brother who died of cancer and, and I, I, last time I saw my brother uh, he was in uh, bed uh, and last time I saw my dad he was in bed and sometimes I wake up because I look like them I think this is exactly how I'm going to go so I'm thinking about this and I'm in the lakes and there's all this beauty of the lakes and I wanted to try and capture something of that moment. So this is, this is a poem called, um, it's number 52 in your songbook. <laughs> uh, I've got 80 poems in here. I'm only going to read about 10 tonight. So uh, there's a good uh, 70 that might be good. <laughs> this, is, this is called Night Fishing. Uh, if you want to close your eyes and try to imagine you've got a trip to Italy without paying. <laughs> it's called Night Fishing. You can choose to give these mountains any name you want. At this moment, they are yours. To the north, no sign of human habitation. Untamed ridges, muted blue and grey, backlit with a peach haze. To the east, a line of streetlights marks out civilization like a landing strip. To the south, across the plasma screen of the lake's surface, beacons appear on the slopes and reflect like the tracks of tears. To the west, the lap of the wake, a moored yacht sways so gently as if to lull a baby to sleep. At the heart, in a small rowboat, a man and his son sit and fish in water from the ice age, silent as a distant star. We are greater than gods tonight. We are life. So this, this building here, this complex, this is where Granada was. This is where we filmed uh, Mrs. Merton uh, and, and this is where we wrote uh, Mrs. Merton and the Royal Family. And uh, we used to be, I don't know, uh, about the sixth floor, I think. And uh, I always remember um, uh, we used to have executive producers coming from the BBC and Caroline used to lean out the window uh, as they were leaving the building and shout, do a funny walk. And they'd do a funny walk over the road and we would clap, uh, clap and cheer. Um, that's a sort of uh, irreverence for, um, for management that Caroline used to have. Between the words that I don't say Beneath your sacred nights and days Through the gales of life we I love the great poems that, that we remember from olden times. Uh, are, uh, are a mixture of romance and nature. So I thought I'd have a go at that. Romance and nature. And you know, if you think about it, things like uh, She Walks in Beauty with the Night, and My Love is Like a Red, Red Rose. Um, uh, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day? And I thought I, I'll, I'll give this a go. So th this is my romance nature poem. Sex in the Woods. <laughs> I've captured it in one line, but there is more. <laughs> Sex in the woods is a lot of fun. If you don't mind the bugs and twigs up your bum. <laughs> See, four lines, that's all you need. That's why I call a ditty or, or uh, the busy man's sonnet. I'm not sure as I ever had uh, much of a relationship to nature. Uh, um, uh, well, an urban nature. Do you know what I mean? Uh, uh, like I've never been agricultural and uh, going to the, uh, the countryside is, is like, uh, you know, in, in my youth it was a bit like going to, uh, uh, to the seaside, it was, it was a holiday thing, so that was your relationship with it. I always remember Linda Smith used to have a joke, uh, the trouble with the countryside is you're never quite sure when you're there. It's got no centre to it, has it? It just, just is. Uh, nowadays, I mean, I, lo I love, uh, you know, nature and everything, but um, we see it quite uh, cultivated, like here, where it's a, a park. Um, occasionally I see it uh, in, in some sort of uh, disarray, some sort of, uh, um, you know, naturalism, um, but not very often. Even now I'm in nature and I'm on the phone. I was, I was quite gregarious uh, um, 
before my mum died. And I, I, I always remember the day that uh, we found out, because I, I come home from school, it was a lunchtime, and there was people in the house that I didn't know. And uh, there was a vicar there, and uh, I, uh, there's no reason why. We'd never have the vicar in the house, so, you know, we're not really religious. And, um, and uh, I kept saying, I want to go back to school, because it was football in the afternoon. And uh, they said, no, you've got to wait for your dad to come home, you've got to wait for your dad. Uh, and uh, so there was my elder brother and my uh, elder sister uh, talking to me. And then, uh, and I think Dave uh, already knew what was happening, but, but Lynn didn't. And my dad came and he put Linda on one knee and me on the other knee and, and he said that uh, my mum was dead. And uh, Linda, Linda just, you know, she's a teenage girl, she's two years older than me, she's 13. She just went spare. Uh, she's just uncontrollable. So, uh, and I, I didn't quite understand. I didn't understand what, what he was saying. And so, I, I, Dad sort of passed me over to somebody so he could uh, uh, sort out Lynn. And, uh, and I, I, was, I don't know who I was with, some woman I'd never seen before. Um, and it, it wasn't until maybe a couple of days later when I sat on Mum's bed. That, uh, that I realised what it meant. I always remember I was um, I was in the Cubs and, uh, in, in the Scouts, and I remember we was on uh, was on uh, a coast trip down south sometime, and I, I tried to think what it'd be like to be dead. And uh, I was on this coach, and I closed my eyes, and I was trying to think like, like you can't hear anything, you can't see anything. And and, I, and and you can't feel anything. And for a, I sort of I had to open my eyes very quickly because I, I sort of it just frightened me a little bit. Um, and I think it was f sort of at that point I sort of uh, from then onwards I sort of had a. That must have been around 11 or 12. I, I had this thing of um, that you you essentially live with death all your life. Um, but it, it wasn't until a few years later that, uh, that uh, anybody else that I know uh, died. But uh, it was sort of always there. Uh, it must be always there for all of us. It's just uh, I, I got a stark reminder quite early. You're not having this and I'm not having that I'm not a reasonable man I've come for it back Let them all in in the, in the television and film industry, you, um, uh, you you kiss people and hug people, even if you don't like them, especially if you don't like them so they don't stab you. <laughs> and and uh, so my wife wrote a, a, a film with uh, Sigourney Weaver and Alan Rickman called Snow Cake. For the premiere, uh, my dad came, right, and, uh, and I'm hugging and kissing all these people and shaking hands and everything, and I'm thinking, I've got to shake my dad's hand. I ain't shook my dad's hand ever. And he's in his 80s, and I'm in my, in my, in my 50s, and, I, and I, I think, I'm going to give him a hug. I'm going to give my dad his first hug. So, so I, I goes up to him, and I, I go, give him a hug like that. And he stands there like that, and he goes, <laughs> and he says, oh, that's very nice. <laughs> Never moved. <laughs> This is a, a little poem called uh, Tin Fruit and Evaporated Milk. It's what we always used to have on Saturday tea times. So it was last Saturday tea time when I called in at my dad's. He was sat checking his racing results. I ambled across the room and turned off the TV. Just a second, I said, Dad, before he started to protest. I've got something important to tell you. I hesitated a moment, then bracing myself, I came right out with it. I love you, Dad. Don't be so bloody daft, he said. It's not daft, I said, I, I love you. Uh, all right, he says, put kettle on. 
No, you're supposed to say, I love you too, son. Come on, Dad, you've seen Dallas. <laughs> I've not got time for all this bloody nonsense. He says, I'm off to Legion. So I'm following him down the garden path. And I'm saying, look, Dad, uh, I'm in my 50s now. It's about time it was out in the open. I love you. And he's trying to shush me in case the neighbor's here. <laughs> so I shout louder, I don't care if the old world is. I'm not ashamed of my feelings. I love you. You're my dad. And I give him a big wet kiss on the forehead. What do you say, Dad? What do you say? Oh, Henry said, where did I go wrong? <laughs> dad had that um, northern man, working man thing where he left the kids to, to the mum. But he did, he did work hard and, uh, uh, you know, he, was, um, he always wore a suit and, uh, you know, and a shirt and uh, often a tie. And um, he, had a, he had great dignity and pride. But, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't really um, uh, able to show affection uh, or, or communicate uh, brilliantly with, uh, with us. We, we never talked about my mum, uh, really, after she died. He, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't talk about it. He certainly wouldn't talk about the car accident. Because he was driving and he, he ran into a, uh, he ran into a uh, parked car early in the morning. And... Um, I think he felt guilty about it, but you know, accident, accidents happen. I think we knew that for, for, from kids that, that it, it was an accident. But I, th I think it, he never, never actually slept in his bed. Uh, he slept downstairs. He never slept again in, in their uh, in their bed um, until he uh, until we moved house and he, he got married a second time. So that was that was years. I don't know, maybe six years. So this next one's called, If You Leave Me, Walk Out Backwards, So I Think You're Coming In. <laughs> it's not, but I just love that title. It's a good title, isn't it? It's called, uh, The House Is Not The Same Since You Left. The house is not the same since you left. The cooker is angry. It blames me. The TV tries desperately to stay busy, but occasionally I catch it staring out of the window. The washing up's feeling sorry for itself again. It just sits there saying, what's the point? What's the point? The curtains count the days. Nothing in the house will talk to me. I think your armchair's dead. The kettle tried to come for me at first, but you know what its attention span's like. I've not told the plants yet. They still think you're on holiday. The bathroom misses you. I hardly see it these days. It still can't believe you didn't take it with you. The bedroom won't even look at me. Since you left, it keeps its eyes closed. All it wants to do is sleep, remembering better times, trying to lose itself in dreams. It seems it's taken the easy way out, but at night I hear the pillows weeping into the sheets. I think it was about 14 I started writing uh, poems. Um, and uh, I read uh, a lot of books. I used to read, uh, I mean, I used to read hundreds of um, humour books, um, anything from the, you know, the Goon Show scripts, uh, Monty Python, uh, but I'd read anybody, Alan Corrin, uh, uh, you know, New York uh, writers I particularly liked, um, and it, I suppose it was an escape in a way, that it was another world, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't Bilbra Council Estate, it was, uh, there was a romance to it, that it was, it was somewhere else, somewhere, um, somewhere better. I was on once with five mime artists. I thought I'd gone deaf. <laughs> and I, I got home and I found I'd been burgled, so I wrote this poem, it's called Mime Doesn't Pay. <laughs> Last night, I was burgled by a mime artist. He never made a sound. He could have got away with it, but then he tried to steal a piano I haven't got. He pushed and he pulled, he, he strained and he heaved, but he wouldn't budge. Maybe he thought there was something valuable behind it. There wasn't. He tried to float the piano. He blew up a balloon, tied it to the piano, then he couldn't lift the balloon. I found him in the morning trapped inside an imaginary box. <laughs> I called the police, he started to panic. He tried climbing up a fictitious ladder. 
When the police arrived, they let him out. He made a dash for it, tried running away on the spot. <laughs> Took the police four hours to get him into the car. He kept getting pulled back by an invisible rope. <laughs> this afternoon, I decided not to press charges. I put an insurance claim in for the piano. <laughs> oh, this is a little poem to my son. I wanted to, uh, I wrote some poems about him and I wanted to write a poem to him. Uh, and uh, uh, it, you don't have to be autistic for this. This is a poem you could write to any son or any daughter or, or anybody. It, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's just nice, uh, um, just nice poem. It's called if you, if you Should Ever Climb a Tree. I'm not sure how much weight my head can support, but I enjoy the familiarity, the casual lack of boundaries. Without utterance, we get a sense of someone. If you should ever climb a tree, I will be your low-hanging branch. I want that to be unquestioned. If my neck snaps, it was meant to be. It's the most important thing to know. In the absence of sufficient language, I would rather seek out trees to remind you. Um, I've, uh, I've only ever had one argument with my wife, and she, uh, about 20 years ago. Now, I, I know you're already on my side, but, uh, <laughs> no, but, you know, bear with it, bear with it. You know, there's two sides, two sides to the argument. So, uh, so you've, got you've got to imagine me a bit younger, right? So, so I'm watching the telly, uh, you've probably had the same argument yourself, so I'm watching the telly, and, and, uh, and I'm watching, but I'm wanting to take what's on the other side. I can't get their remote to work. So I shout, Ange! And, and she gets out of the bath. <laughs> totally naked, dripping. And, and she comes and she explains to me that the remotes don't work, you've got to go to the television. So she goes to the television, she's dripping all over the electrics, <laughs> she's sorting it out. And I, I'm laid on, on the settee. She's in front of the screen, isn't she? <laughs> so, so, I, so I says, I'm missing it now. <laughs> she gets up, didn't say a word, walks off, gets back in the bath. How selfish is that? <laughs> I thought, if that's your attitude, fuck it, I'm not going to have an argument with you. <laughs> that was it. We've no, never argued since, so... Uh, <laughs> nice audience. I think, uh, I think they... Uh, I wasn't sure how many people had seen me before or how many people had just took a chance, but they seemed, uh, they seemed to get into it fairly quickly. And, um, you're right, Janice. Sorry about that. So, have you learned anything so far? Have <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I haven't learned anything so far. Yes, stay at home. Uh, I haven't learned anything so far. Ah, I've learned that I don't like stopping in hotels. I don't know how these people do it. I, I take my hat off to, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, comics that tour, uh, you know, or well, anybody that, that tours, uh, actors and whatever. Um, the idea of living out of hotels and uh, spending your days between performances, either waiting for the performance or... or you know, uh, doing something towards the performance or, or just killing time or, you know, and you're in a city that you don't particularly know. So, I mean, it was nice as having um, uh, a cup of tea and a, a scone by the uh, river yesterday. I, I really enjoyed that. It, I was saying uh, uh, to Yanis, uh, Ben, that uh, my mind, I sit here, my mind goes back to sitting in the cafe in, um, in Manchester. And really, life is the bits in between sitting and having a cup of tea. Do you know what I mean? And, and then we, we have a cup of tea now, and then we'll do some other stuff, and then we'll sit and have another cup of tea. And it's lovely, that idea that you know that at some point you're going to sit and have a cup of tea. That's, you know, that's the constant in life. That's worth, worth waiting for. You can deal with all the other stuff, so long as you're going to have a cup of tea at some point. When, uh, when we found out about Johnny, 
we went to uh, a psychiatrist in, in America. Because I'm a working class lad, I've, I've never been to a psychiatrist. It's quite a weird thing. And the psychiatrist said, he, he said to me, he said, he's been in business for 30 years. He said, and everybody that's come to him had the same problem. I thought, that can't be right. How can that be right? So everybody that came to him had, had the same problem. And it was, they don't feel they're good enough. What a strange animal we are. We're afraid of each other and we don't think we're good enough. Strange animal. So, at home, I've got, uh, um, I've got this lovely view of the sea, but the thing that catches my attention more than anything is I've got a picture, I don't know whether you know this photograph, it's called uh, Pale Blue Dot. And uh, it's a big uh, photograph and there's one little bit that's the earth and it's one pixel. And it was taken by um, the Voyager spaceship as it, as it went to the so, uh, the solar system. Carl Sager, the, the presenter, got them to turn it around and take this picture of Earth. So it's, it's what you might call sort of the furthest selfie that you could ever take. And if you're 26, you're on this picture. And I was looking at this and thinking, all our hopes and dreams and fears are in this one pixel. I will be uh, uh, either sat on my own uh, <laughs> or, or signing some, some books later. Um, first thing I said uh, um, to Ange when... Um, when we heard about Johnny was, uh, uh, I said, I can't cope. And she said, you can. And as you know, I don't argue with my wife. <laughs> so I try. Let's go to prayer for the hesitant. <clears throat> a pale blue dot amid a family portrait this is your own planet. This is where you were born to be. Breathe. The world is your living room. You are amongst friends. Your ancestors, your family, and over 10,000 saints look down. Nobody means you any harm, not even God or nature. You can choose not to fear. The universe expects nothing. Every single thing is more than nothing. You've already exceeded expectation. If you forget me, my name, this moment, remember only this, you are good enough. Imperfect as we are, you are good enough. The show tomorrow, uh, it would be a very different show tomorrow, in that um, it's a show I've only done once. Uh, I did it a year ago. It was the first show I did after coming back for, for 20 years. It was the first show I did, which was a show about my son. And uh, uh, so it's, all the, um, the poems are uh, about family life. And I've got um, photographs that are uh, mainly taken by my wife. She takes most of the photographs, but some by me and uh, some by other people. And, um, and so some of the, the story and the ideas will be, will be uh, from the photographs. Um, and there'll be some poems that I don't think you, you'll have seen uh, at the other gigs because they're, they're more connected with, uh, with autism. And I, I, I didn't want to, I wanted the mix for the other shows to be uh, a bit of everything, whereas, you know, uh, I think we're going to get about 60 people there and they'll all have a connection with autism, so this is a show for them. So I run a business for, uh, for 16 and a half years where when we started, Steve and I had never made a television programme. Uh, we'd never made a television programme uh, and therefore we, <laughs> we told the BBC we were going to make television programmes, they'd given us uh, some advanced money and 
we had to trust people. We won an award with the, the first programme, so Human Remains and, and uh, Marin and Jeff both won RTS awards. And that was probably one of the proudest nights of my, my life, because I, I sat with um, Steve and uh, Jane Root, who was the head of BBC Two, and uh, um, uh, Rob Ryder and uh, Julia Davis at the RTS Awards. And it was a little bit like being a dad uh, and seeing you know, the, them both get RTS Awards. I think there's a lot of people came out of those years of Baby Cow um, uh, where they rose to the occasion and it was just about giving people the opportunity. And uh, I like to think that there's a lot of people uh, creating stuff now that we've just helped a little bit along the way to, uh, to do that. That's sort of better than awards, to be honest with you. If I see, uh, you know, somebody uh, really doing well, and I think, well, you know, we just give them a, a little leg up at one point in time. That, that's that's a better than an award. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's great Monday. <laughs> the weekend starts here. <laughs> it's great. It's, it, it's obviously very exciting on a Monday. In, uh, uh, Jordan, so uh, thanks. <laughs> you, you, you're coming over from everywhere else. Um, I, I just, I, I'd done Chester last night and, and I live in Brighton, so I, I, I was sort of passing through, <laughs> to be honest with you. So I, I, th I thought it was great. And uh, Duff uh, gave, uh, gave me a ring, as he said, uh, a while back, and uh, um, it just seemed uh, a nice thing to do. I, I, this show that I'm going to do tonight, I, I've only ever done it once. And I did it a, a year ago, and, uh, and I'd not actually performed for about 20 years. Uh, I've been doing television, I've been doing films, and, and I, I did this show across. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I started writing poems. I'll t tell you all about why, but I started writing poems about my life. Uh, and, and I wanted to be able to, uh, to, you know, to let people uh, know about them. So I did this show, and I've only done it once. But that resulted in doing the radio show. Anybody actually uh, hear the radio show that I did on Radio 4? <laughs> Do you get a for? Uh, I, love, I love these chairs down the front. They're, they're like nobody actually wanted to sit there. It's like punishment if somebody comes late. They walk all the way down uh, to, the, to the chairs. It's like a little buffer zone. Well, uh, no, even no fly zone. But uh, thanks. Uh, it's a very friendly show. Uh, you know, uh, you can uh, audience participate. But it is, a, it is a poetry show. So if you're good at Eckle, uh, I am big pentameter. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of jokes in this show, so do enjoy them and, uh, and uh, you know, laugh out loud. Don't keep it all in. <laughs> it's not good for you. Don't go home tonight and go, I could have laughed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fool to myself. <laughs> enjoy yourself here while you're here. So anyway, I've got some slides. So I've got some slides, uh, I've got some funny poems, some serious poems, some jokes. So it's like a, it's like a, sort of a, a poetic salad with me as a tosser. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gauging you at the moment. <laughs> I think we're all right, I think I've got your level. So, uh, so, good. so, so this, is, uh, this is me and my lad, this is Johnny, uh, he's, he's my lad. Uh, he's 18 now, this was taken a couple of years ago, uh, uh, August Bank Holiday. <laughs> <laughs> Could be any day of the year. <laughs> right. So this is Brighton Beach. You'll see me at Stones on Brighton Beach, and, and I love that. I love this. Uh, so I, I, start, I started writing uh, poems based on uh, photos because I wanted to remember the journey that I'd been on with Johnny, and uh, we're in a good place now. Uh, um, but we haven't always been in a good place. Now I'll tell you a little bit about the story. And, and I, I wanted to celebrate that and celebrate that, that we were in a good place. So uh, there's no miracle cures in this. He's, he's not like swan with dolphins and, and now he can sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, break, break the atom or anything like that. No, it, it, none of that. It's just that we're in a bad place and it, it was very uh, selective. And now uh, we, have a, we have a good time and, uh, and uh, we found a way of, uh, of enjoying life and living together. That, that's essentially the story, so don't expect some uh, explosive ending. But it's not a depressing story, so it's a great story, and I'm happy to, happy to tell you. Um, he's, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to read a, a little poem just to get you off so you understand what the, how the poems go. Um, this, is, uh, this is the first one. It's called uh, King Canute Should Have Checked the Tides. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's. Um, uh, they say that, uh, they say that um, there's no such thing as bad weather, it's just the wrong clothes. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, uh, and and uh, I, I, that's what I think about uh, uh, about families and about uh, you know, stuff that you do. So th this is a sort of poem about us, a little poem based on, on on this on this picture. Taking your own chair to the beach is a commitment. Fleecy on, hood up. Better to keep your limbs moving, some might say, but sitting is a definite statement. We're not just passing through; we're making a stand, sitting firm. Day trippers we are not nor ill-prepared tourists. We are rocks among scattered pebbles, stones among shingle. Bring on your ice wave, the glory is ours. We live here, we own this weather. Thank you. Um, the, uh, uh, lovely to, to come to Jordan. Uh, um, the, uh, I, 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 live in, I live in Brighton now. Anybody been to Brighton? Anybody know Brighton? <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's, it's a lovely place, uh, uh, Brighton. Uh, uh, we've got that I three sixty now. Have you have you seen this? If you yes. want to come down and have a look, Keeps apparently it's so so tall. Sorry. Keeps breaking down. Keeps breaking down. <laughs> yes, yes. And I did hear that somebody got on it the other day, and they complained that uh, they were there for half an hour and somebody got terrible flatulence. <laughs> <laughs> so be careful who you go on with. But, uh, um, <laughs> It's so, it's so tall, I understand, that on a clear day, you can see a parking space. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I'm, I, I, when, uh, when Duff says to me, uh, come down, I'm not sure we're going to get an audience to be honest with you, and obviously we've got a, a brilliant audience here. And, 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 uh, but I put it on Facebook, and I, I thought, I don't know whether there's anybody around here uh, on Facebook, but I don't know, I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> you've got your own, you've got your own. <laughs> On telegraph poles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm better known here than I am where I live. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? And, uh, you still got one on from the suffragettes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, 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 this is a film that's on, uh, so come and come and see this. Uh, uh, no, that's nice. So, uh, so I, 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 Duff took me round. We had a, we had a little walk round, and uh, and, and I, I, this one, this one, I <laughs> this, this is this is it's how to complain about the overhead wires. <laughs> <laughs> I like the fact that I was the support act. <laughs> <laughs> the overhead wires, but there you go. Uh, and, uh, so he took me around and I went, I went down to the, the side and, and I, I, it's, it's lovely this, so you, you could miss it, you could miss it if you could, <laughs> but, but, but you wouldn't miss the village shop. <laughs> There's not many village shops get their own signposts. <laughs> I, I, I love that. Uh, you know, uh, very obviously very proud of your village shop, which, which I like. And you go in the village shop and there's a poster of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so star billing in the village shop. Uh, that's great. And uh, obviously, this is word of mouth, isn't it? People have, have uh, talked to people, and it's just like it's sort of like old-fashioned talking. <laughs> you know, now, if you can talk to the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you imagine what could happen? <laughs> so, I mean, Jesus only had 12. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He did a bit of poetry about 2,000 years ago, you know, uh, uh, just the one uncle. <laughs> Founded by the Quakers, and I am a big fan of the Quakers. I, I, I like the, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 they don't go too heavy on all the iconography and, and that. They're, they're, they're simple. It's between you and God. Now, I, I like. I'm not. I'm not religious at all. I'm C of E. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a religion really. It's a nature agency for Henry the Eighth. <laughs> It's a lovely village, and, and I, had a, I had a look round, and I love your Christmas tree. And I'm glad the slide's going away from the Christmas tree because that actually cause accidents. And, uh, and Duff was telling me that he, he put one of my posters on a tree, and uh, and somebody, uh, you know, one, one of you, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not asking for names. One of you, uh, 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 very politely, didn't stick it in the bin, took it off the tree. Put it on a telegraph pole. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I'm from Nottingham uh, originally, and I, lo I love trees. I, I miss trees in Brighton. And uh, I, I, I'm a bit sentimental, you'll, you'll find this about me. And I remember uh, going into DFS once, 
and um, and I cried at furniture. <laughs> Seriously, I said, they make such sort of shit furniture. <laughs> if you're gonna chop down a tree, make something beautiful. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, so, so I, 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 love, I love this. And uh, I was a bit worried when I arrived, so I pulled in, and I know this is uh, like a school and everything, and I, 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 pulled, I pulled in and uh, I saw this. <laughs> <laughs> So this is uh, this is the first inkling I had of, uh, of Johnny. So this is um, uh, this is a sonograph. I don't, you can't see it very well. So I was working at the Mrs. Merton show uh, uh, at the time we had uh, Johnny, in, and I was script editing and writing the Mrs. Merton show, and. Um, and she sent me this, uh, and it was quite nice. She, she sent me this as a, as a fax, and she put a little speech bubble here, and it says, Hello, Dad. Oh. Oh. Uh, not strictly speaking, his first words. <laughs> <laughs> and Jan wrote that. But uh, his, his, his first word was star. I always remember that. I, I don't know whether he, he was referring to me <laughs> <laughs> or, or Ange. Uh, um, but, but, but that, so that, that was nice. So, so uh, I, and like, uh, like a lot of people, um, you know, it's my first kid. Uh, um, I, I know there's big parents in tonight, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, and people, I'm, I'm sure some of you had parents. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or you know people who had parents. You know, there's a, there's a click of the end, and there's a weird thing that happens when, when you become parents. And uh, uh, I remember in, in Brighton, it's a weird thing, I, I, when, you, when you, uh, um, you get to the maternity ward for, for uh, a driving kid, it's actually on the 13th floor. <laughs> As if you're not nervous enough already. <laughs> and uh, and we, so anyway, we, we went and it, it, it seemed like a normal, but we had a Fontoos uh, thing uh, um, because it was quite a long time and, and, and sh uh, you know, uh, she, 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 you know, she was, she was uh, quite exhausted for, from the labour and we had, we had a Fontoos thing. So when uh, the first time I saw Johnny, he, he came out, it, it got like a long, <laughs> like, like, like one of them tea foam men, <laughs> and it was purple, so like, like, it was like a purple tea foam man, and, and, and they said, oh, it'll, it'll soon settle down, and it, and it did, and it, and it was all right, and, and, um, and, and I remember, I remember going home, and do you know when you're, uh, I'm sure some of you, uh, I'm sure some of the men will, uh, will relate to this, uh, there's something about the battle that uh, my wife had done. And the, there was something about the, the battle that my lad had done. And, and you'd think I'd feel relief, but I didn't feel relief. It was um, determination. There was something about it where I felt... And I'd not felt this before. That he was going to have all the things that I didn't have. And I remember thinking it was a bit like a footballer when, um, when somebody scores a goal and they get the ball and they put it back on the centre spot and they get game on. I love that. And I'm sure I can't be the only person that's got that. And nobody's ever said it to me. So I wanted to say it to you because if you got it, that's a beautiful thing. A lovely little story about uh, uh, Dave when he was dying, which uh, I, I, I find very inspirational. So, so uh, my brother Dave he died before my dad. Uh, they both died of uh, cancer, and they both uh, were laid in bed in uh, hospices. Uh, well, uh, my dad at home, uh, um, Dave in an hospice. Uh, and um, he laid there, and uh, so I've got three sisters, and uh, uh, and his wife Jan was there, and uh, and me, and we, we we sort of stayed with him uh, uh, for a few days. It was about it was about three days uh, as he was uh, as he was dying, and because um, he's the eldest, um, uh, it was. Um, the relationships with 
me and, and the, the sisters was probably that of, a, uh, of an older brother. And uh, there was one bit where he was quite drugged up and he was, uh, he was, um, he was quiet. Um, the youngest sister, Angela, um, said, uh, are you all right, Dave? Uh, and he, he, he whispered to her, and I think he whispered this because he, he, he was trying to make it easier for her. He said, uh, I'm hatching a plan. I love that, like he'd got an escape plan. sleepless days I found that in my dreamless sleep I'm bound to one night hear the sound of you calling do not stumble through tonight have no fear of falling 